Bien, euh, on ne présente pas Jean Plantu. Well, let me introduce you to uh, Jean Plantu. He is it forever young, eternally young, and some people when they read uh, the Monde, they feel like they're reading a cartoon, because he is a cartoonist after all, but uh, it's a different reading of uh, Le Monde, uh, the French uh, daily. And Le Monde made him famous, and then he started uh, a journey with the uh, General Secretary of the United Nations, namely Cartooning for Peace. And this is a journey, an initiative, uh, which uh, he started uh, with the Secretary General. And uh, two women and one man will be uh, uh, sketching you, one after the other. And they're not there to sketch uh, Plantu, there's a surprise. But what is uh, also surprising is the fact that there is a Cuban uh, man from Venezuela with an American lady, uh, an Israeli with a Palestinian and a Tunisian. And all these cartoonists are working together and all this uh, is uh, Jean's uh, project, initiative, and Jean is going to moderate uh, the uh, f next session, uh, interesting session at that, which is culture as a factor of uh, peace. Jean, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Jean. Uh, Nicolas, sorry. Thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to make peace for about uh, three quarters of an hour. You have no idea how often we uh, come across uh, people who are building peace, uh, constructing peace. And peace is just round the corner, we're told. Uh, in 93, people felt that uh, it was just about to uh, to be reality in the months uh, that followed. And now what we're going to try is, uh, what we're going to try to do is to act as spontaneously as possible. Nadia Kari, um, hello, uh, I'd like to greet you because you are uh, the living soul of uh, Tunisian uh, society. She draws uh, those little cats. You've seen these kittens uh, throughout the uh, forum and you will uh, be able to uh, see those uh, little uh, um, kittens on yakayaka.com uh, yaka.com and this uh, is the uh, um, the very soul of uh, new Tunisia uh, Tunisia in movement and you are um, the image the very image of this society and there's a factor of peace in which I certainly believe and there are some the, the, the uh, cartoons uh, drawn by uh, uh, Nadia Bakfi, uh, Jean Bekilsa, are um, a way of uh, showing pictures uh, that disturb. And sometimes uh, uh, some, um, some cartoons that are um, like, like the ones by our f a Cuban friend, like Kishka, uh, who works in Israel, who uh, also who works in uh, West uh, Jerusalem, mm -hmm. Hara Welafe, who is a, a Palestinian um, cartoonist. He works for I Quds, a Palestinian newspaper, and he works in uh, East Jerusalem. And Chaim Welafe also has talent and courage, because with his uh, paper, Al Quds, he criticizes Gaza. He criticizes Hamas and he has a brother in the Hamas. And when he went to see his brother in prison, because uh, every now and then uh, people land in uh, prisons, but we'll discuss it. There are prisons in uh, Israel, everyone knows that, but there are prisons in Palestine too. And uh, I am uh, struck by the fact that when you read uh, reports about uh, um, the um, death corridor in the States, in newspapers in France, for instance, and when you hear about uh, people sentenced to death in the States, everyone talks about it. But when somebody is hung in um, Gaza, no one talks about it. And unfortunately, there are such executions taking place in Gaza. So with all these drawing, drawings, uh, we have a, a light uh, shed on, on reality. And there's Jaima uh, from Venezuela. And she is a cartoonist who sketches, who draws uh, cartoons, opposition cartoons in Venezuela. And Liza Donnelly is uh, yet another cartoonist. Uh, she works in New York, and she's quite famous in New York because she works for The New Yorker and also for Forbes Journal. And uh, she represents uh, uh, the uh, State Department 
Uh, well, she is representative for culture at the State Department. I asked you whether you knew Obama. Well, there's a seat free next to you, so should he decide to come and join you, he's more than welcome. And you will tell us about the, your, uh, the work you carry out uh, for women, notably, as uh, does uh, Salmia Benima, who is a CEO of a company called Sanabil Med. Uh, and uh, this. Uh, and, and you deal with this. Um, with, you deal with digital uh, publishing, but you also work with uh, and for Tunisian women. So I know that uh, you know uh, Nadia Kiari very well. Sana Ganima, Israel, Palestine, Palestine, Israel. Well, Middle East certainly. Pacified Middle East, because I'm finding it difficult. Uh, uh, to find people who don't want peace between the two. And uh, when I was a child, and I used to go to Germany, and uh, people would tell me, what are you going to see crowds for? And I said, well, yes, I go on holiday in Germany. Why not? I have family there. And uh, in years to come, there will be young people from Beirut who will go to Jerusalem, a young Israeli who will go to Beirut, who will go to Haman, um, Palestinians uh, who will go from uh, Ramallah without having to go through a checkpoint point to Jerusalem. Uh, not so long ago, with the, another cartoonist, uh, uh, we, uh, we did this, uh, see? Drawings where we try to uh, bring together with this uh, dove, a peace dove, the, uh, the circle for the eye of the dove is the circle for peace as well. So people tend to say that uh, peace goes through uh, culture, but when things are round, everything is possible, hence this circle. And you are friends of France, you're a former ambassador of uh, Israel in France, Eli Barnavi, so you know what it's all about when it comes to uh, trying to s even things out, uh, smooth things out. Uh, when you were an ambassador, you were certainly familiar with this. And Anwar Abu Aisha, you are Minister of Culture of the Palestinian Authority. Uh, well, I don't like the word Palestinian Authority. I'd rather say Palestine and Israel. So I would say that you are Minister of Culture of Palestine. I, I just can't stand this word, Palestinian Authority. Don't you find it annoying? Answer, well, I will, will have a few things to say about this. Well, I'll give you the floor without further ado. And could you tell us how in Palestine you deal with culture. Khalian Monafe or Baral Bukal, another cartoonist in uh, Ramallah, uh, was a friend of Yasser Arafat, uh, has done work uh, for peace. But when you create uh, films, movies, when uh, you uh, have uh, creators and artists uh, who uh, can uh, reach out to their uh, friends in Israel. Uh, that's always a good thing. The lemon trees, for instance, that certainly is a way of reaching out to Palestine. So could you, uh, Minister, tell us more about this? The Minister, do I really have to follow your train of thought? Uh, uh, I would uh, like to start uh, with uh, something else. Well, just be s as spontaneous as you like, yeah, and then we'll see a few pictures. Yes, I'll be uh, short, but I'd like to tell you a story about my m mother. My grandmother decided to take my mother out of school at a very early age, so she was illiterate. She couldn't read or write, uh, and I invited her in Paris uh, in 1984. I come from Hebron, where we have uh, about a dozen of prophets that are buried. So we are the sort of uh, uh, Belgian, uh, Belgians of the uh, Middle East, so it's a sort of Belgian joke. So she came to uh, see me in Paris in 1984, and I was uh, going through the streets, and on the 25th of August, 84, we saw many flowers against the wall. And my mother was asking me, well, how come there, were, there are flowers everywhere today? And I said, well, it is because 40 years ago, Paris was liberated. And then she said, they, had, they experienced war here? And I said, yes, yes, there was a war here. And it was an awful one. And then she said, but who won <laughs> the war, the Jews or the Arabs? Plantu. It reminds me of a, a cartoon. Uh, it's an Israeli uh, cartoonist. I don't always agree with him. Sharka is his name. He comes from the occupied uh, territory, so um, it, it gets on my nerves to a certain extent. But I like him, and we always get to discuss uh, with one another. And he sketched, uh, he, he did a drawing where you can see a Palestinian and a rocket. 
quite a powerful one and uh, with explosives on it. And the father says to the uh, son, this is a rocket that will explode and will go towards uh, the moon. And then the young boy says, how come, are there Israelis on the moon? Well, so you see, there is a parallel here with my uh, uh, funny anecdote. Yes, it is the first time I take part in the Forum d'Avignon. And, and before coming here, I really didn't know what I would be talking about. Uh, speak from the heart, says the moderator. Well, yes, I will. <clears throat> I believe we are uh, a people that is unable to live without uh, humor. It's, it's part of our culture. I am chairman of an association The Mobile Library for Nonviolence and Peace. That's the name of our association. And uh, we uh, go uh, and visit schools with the associations. Uh, we uh, um, distribute brochures about nonviolence, uh, peaceful protests, uh, Gandhi. And the question is as follows Can culture be a factor of peace? Well, the answer is clear and obvious, yes, it can. Then the other question is how. But what I'm mostly interested in is the internal piece of in within uh, the Palestinian society, because it's a challenging uh, situation. So there is domestic violence, there is violence between citizens, uh, there is a, a, a pathological lack of stability. This certainly doesn't help um, to create inner peace. And now the question is, how can culture play a part in peace between Israel and Palestine? Well, that's a much trickier uh, question. And my answer would be that in order to make peace with someone, you need to know him. It's easy for me to know uh, Eli Barnavi. I have friends in Israel, in Jerusalem. I have Israeli friends here in France. But the man in the street in Palestine uh, will only uh, know uh, settlers and Israeli uh, soldiers. Uh, that's all they know about foreigners. Uh, soldiers destroy their houses, settlers take their land. Uh, uh, the military occupation uh, prevents him from uh, moving freely. So yes, we need to uh, organize cultural activities in order to educate for peace, of course. But as a minister of uh, culture in Palestine, <coughs> I try to educate for peace, but I also support any project uh, to do with nonviolent resistance, cultural identity, and the preserve of uh, cultural identity. This is uh, what I work towards as a minister. And I think that the only way we can use culture is if there is a minimum of justice already uh, existing. And this hatred that can be uh, instilled in my fellow countrymen against you, against Israeli, for instance, where does it come from? And these are conversations I have on a daily basis in Palestine. Well, you know, when there's a, a double standard in the conflict, well, this instills, this uh, creates hatred. And for us to experience peace, we need understanding. And we need to do away with the hatred. So now we've opened the debate. and this will be my last sentence, I would say that you can not discuss about culture with people who are threatened on a daily basis in their houses, who are hungry, who are unable to move freely in their own countries. So I think that if we want to talk about culture and peace, we need to talk about justice, social justice. And uh, there is a strong link between the former and culture as a factor of peace the moderator. Well, of course, whilst uh, you uh, mentioned these uh, tragic situations in Palestine, uh, it is still, it is true, nevertheless, that there are uh, fabulous encounters with creators. Daniel Barenbaum, for instance, can uh, gather musicians uh, 
uh, from Palestine and from Israel to play together. Well, this uh, goes to show to what extent culture plays an important part. Uh, Avi Katz is uh, an Israeli uh, cartoonist, and in this drawing, he uh, he, he shows with with the uh, movement of the hands uh, uh, a symbol of uh, uh, the dove. The dove. Uh, uh, the two hands symbolize the wings of the dove. And this is one aspect of culture, because uh, culture can also be songs or other ways of means of expression. But this illustrates the suffering. And pe when people suffer, and when they see drawings such as this one, they, they uh, hit the ground running. Mr. Abu Aisheh, you know, Israelis and um, Palestinians meet on a daily basis. Uh, construction workers or uh, road sweepers. Halda Borafe, says the moderator, he is, he is at his uh, a newspaper. And you can see the wall separating Israel from the Palestine uh, at the back of the, uh, the picture there. Eli Barnavi, could you tell us uh, a few words about uh, culture as a factor of peace? Eli Barnavi. Well, I'd like to move away from uh, those uh, Middle Eastern swamps. I am uh, used to debating with uh, Palestinian friends. I talk about debate, but I shouldn't really, because there is, no, there is no debate. There is no need for a debate. We agree on most things. Uh, we d debated or discussed together uh, yesterday on the radio. But I'd like to answer the general question that was asked. The question that was put was, can culture be a source of uh, uh, conflict or a source of uh, uh, peace? And then I will come back to Palestine and Israel, if you'll allow me. I believe that culture can be a factor for peace and for tension, but it all depends on the type of peace um, we're talking about. And this uh, brings us back to the sub last year's subject, uh, culture against uh, barbaric at attitudes. Uh, last year, I was trying to tell you that only a cultivated and hum humanist um, culture can be a defense against uh, barbaric uh, attitudes. Now, rest assured, I will uh, discuss it from a different angle, take it from a different angle. The um, discussion about con human condition, the difference between an individual and a group, and between different groups, is uh, mm -hmm. at the very heart of this debate. Culture is what creates a link between individuals. It uh, makes it possible for individuals to build a society, to create a group. Culture creates such a public space, a polis, as uh, the ancient Greeks uh, would say. And Aristotle uh, said that outside polis, only gods and beasts could live. And uh, a society is uh, driven by codes, and codes are uh, uh, chosen uh, by individuals because they identify in terms of behavior with those codes within the polis. And the organizers of this meeting, ha of this symposium, to use yet another Greek word, symposium, means to drink together and uh, God knows that the Forum d'Avignon is certainly uh, loyal to this uh, old tradition of drinking together and the symposium is a source of conciliation and a source of uh, reconciliation but uh, uh, society is also a way of uh, um, focusing on the individual characteristics of the individual. Individuals are able to uh, rise against uh, diktats. Uh, Antigone and Creon beyond, belong to the same culture. They uh, speak the same language. They obey to the same codes, live by the same codes. But they interpret those codes radically di differently. Uh, Creon. Uh, obeys the rules of uh, the uh, rules of the of the police and uh, that is the only way a society can reconcile itself with itself and then there is another line of a uh, high voltage line as it were and that is within a group when groups feel that they are closed uh, a cultural sets uh, a nation a race a religion a part a political party or a football club then Culture is all about identity, and Amin Marlouf uh, says that it can be a source of uh, crime because it divides humans in uh, um, tight 
uh, categories, uh, different categories, and it creates borders between groups of individuals. It, it defines individuals not by what they do, but what by what they are. And this can only lead to conflict. There's no point in uh, being opposed to globalization, and I'm not opposed to globalization, but globalization is a factor of uh, um, sharpening tensions because globalization focuses on individual characteristics, uh, although it uses ways of communication. But on the other hand, it also creates boundaries between individuals who are victims of uh, economic powers where uh, culture in action has no role to play. So individuals become consumers, consumers of various goods, culture being one of those goods. Individuals are lonely in front of their computer screens or their smartphone. They are flooded by information and they have no time to analyze, to um, sort out the, th the various thoughts. And they are part of networks uh, which are called social networks but are far from being um, sociable networks. And if these uh, virtual groups don't satisfy him, then they have all the other groups, groups um, based on identity, where they will feel the um, warmth of a herd, but then they will lose a great deal. The more uh, borders and frontiers disappear in, through globalization, the more people close in on their identity, religion, for instance, or um, nationalistic uh, thought is another example, uh, or um, concentrating on regional cohesion or region, closing in on the region. The web is master of the world, and all the groups are f find an invasion by uh, the uh, um, these tendencies in the individual spheres. There is no pewter anymore. There is no privacy anymore. People just uh, um, <clears throat> share the most intimate details of their lives. But this is not worthy of a culture of reconciliation because reconciliation needs to offer a neutral space, a space where individuals and groups can communicate with one another to get to know one another. Speaking out can only be a good thing if people speak out in a civilized manner, the moderator. And this is Kishka's, uh, you know Kishka, he's an Israeli um, cartoonist. Uh, you can see here the, the, the stapler here trying to put uh, Europe back together. And uh, Kishka is uh, Israeli, but he's also Belgian, and he likes uh, puns. Oh, he's here. C'est génial, c'est tellement mieux dit que moi. Évidemment, je ne sais pas quelle est la solution. What I said earlier, there's a, a, a tension between uh, creativity and productivity, between groups, between genders. Uh, this, uh, of course, uh, makes things more difficult, but it, it, in a way, this is the uh, uh, only way to um, circumvent this uh, form of a, a unified uh, society. But, of course, you'd be naive to believe that you could uh, reverse the trend of globalization. It's like reversing the course of history. That wouldn't happen, but there is another power. Uh, Culture can civilize tensions, can uh, can uh, control globalization. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, politics, culture, and a, and a true uh, cultural policy, you have to ask, but just what culture are you talking about? Of course, not just any culture. You, uh, uh, the culture, as we were trying to define it last year, uh, culture as a creation of uh, works of the human mind, as a, as a, a constructive works or humanistic culture like the, 
the um, the uh, age of enlightenment that is uh, all focused on the free man who arrived at the uh, at adulthood can to quote Kant be autonomous that is the culture that uh, offers a right stand to politics but uh, what kind of politics are we talking about of course we're talking about democracy democracy since uh, Athens that is uh, uh, delineating the public space, uh, leaving uh, autonomous individuals with reason who can, within that space, uh, use the free speech, uh, having common interests, and uh, find the ways and means to achieve their ends. And, of course, uh, that uh, what the Greeks called the only uh, form of politics or form of society worth having that is democracy but that is what is being challenged today and that is what we have to reinvent today uh, we have to give uh, its uh, dignity back to uh, to politics because of course politics has been completely overwhelmed by globalization and economic wins it has been undermined by demagoguery and uh, you may remember what Guy Debord said in his uh, prophetic text the society of show business uh, we are uh, completely taken over by uh, suspicion and contempt that has been now disguised as a, a civil spirit but that will challenge our very freedom our very culture and indeed, it is uh, one of the miracle of democracies, and God knows this is an imperfect and fragile system, but that can uh, pacify and indeed uh, overcome those uh, con con in contradictions inherent in our condition and make our presence on earth, on life, uh, our life on earth uh, tolerable. And that it is democracy that uh, can um, make it possible to have a cultural policy worth its salt that is uh, bringing together human beings uh, f uh, rallying them around shared uh, artistic and cultural values and uh, as a uh, moral human being I am very much in favor of cultural exception uh, as the French uh, uh, put it but I think the phrases are unfortunate because it's a, it has brought about uh, a number of misunderstandings but uh, uh, we should find at a sort of a, uh, a an optimized or uh, an adapted culture, any case a better phrase, but the idea is not to uh, make a, or turn culture into a commodity. That seems to be an excellent uh, uh, initiative. But of course, uh, you might find there to be a contradiction between a culture and uh, and business or the economy, of course not. Otherwise, we, we, there would be no point in coming here at all. No, there's no. it's not a contradiction. It's just uh, culture not being um, subjugated to the economy. And uh, there must be uh, other models. That is, uh, a model uh, society would uh, work for a, a market economy. But uh, the market itself is a cultural phenomenon. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Et euh, je rappelle que Elie Barnavi est... Well, thank you, uh, Elie Barnavi. Not only are you a friend of France, but uh, you have written quite a lot for Marianne. And so uh, uh, he uh, shares with us his uh, views as an Israeli, as a citizen of the world, his views on culture. Uh, with a capital C and cultures in the plural, but he was uh, able to talk about everything except uh, Israel and uh, and Palestine. Well, of course, you could uh, uh, talk about it until the cows uh, go home, but uh, you, I tend to agree that uh, there's no uh, possible culture without freedom. Of course, uh, uh, culture can only blossom in a context of freedom. And if you haven't got any freedom, you cannot uh, have any culture. Uh, and of course, military occupation. Well, whenever I see Halia Bonafé in his uh, newspaper, he says, uh, he, he says uh, we can uh, create, uh, we have a freedom of creation in, in Israel, but uh, Palestinian cartoonists are censored uh, in the, uh, they cannot talk about uh, uh, illegal occupation. They cannot uh, even use these words, these captions in their drawings. Uh, and this uh, cartoon, I mean, you can see that the Americans can make a difference. They can uh, bring some uh, hope for peace. And uh, we all thought that uh, uh, President Obama was going to help you both, uh, uh, Israelis and Palestinians, to uh, 
build peace. We have our French uh, president. He's uh, very sweet. He does what he can. But in the meantime, you have these dividing walls separating uh, territories. And of course, uh, well, the walls in themselves can be uh, something cultural because you have uh, graffiti on the walls. And uh, well, any case, uh, before uh, moving on, I think that uh, uh, I'm not saying that uh, uh, culture doesn't have a role to play in the context of, uh, say, occupation or lack of freedom. And the relations between uh, people remains important even uh, in this context. And, um, you know, every year I teach in a, in a Palestinian university, uh, and, and that is, of course, a cultural, uh, cultural fact. So uh, when you say uh, that I'm mad at your friend, uh, when he... Uh, uh, when he came to power, I said, look, uh, uh, you have uh, uh, the power now. It is time to build peace. And uh, not only has he not uh, done anything about it, but he has not even responded. Liza, you, uh, you, you draw for the New Yorker magazine, but you talk about women. And I believe you've been around the world uh, telling people why female cartoonists have a role to play to uh, to uh, present their, uh, well, the cu cultural view or women's cultural view of the world. Because, of course, uh, in the world of cartoonists, I mean, at Cartooning for Peace, uh, we, uh, well, 99% of cartoonists are normally are men, but in our club, uh, it's like uh, more 70, 30. And we, and we like to have uh, uh, more women on the show. Uh, so. Two. <laughs> And uh, I just want to thank uh, the forum for inviting me to use my voice um, as well as my, my pen uh, in, in uh, participating in this forum. But yes, I draw for The New Yorker um, and other places, and, and most of what I do is, is I draw about culture. I'm less of a political cartoonist and more of a cultural cartoonist. But I, um, I'm going to talk in broad strokes here and uh, in distilled ideas, because I'm a cartoonist and that's what we do. Primarily, it's the job of the political cartoonist to give opinion. We're artists and we are observers like many other artists. But our job is specifically to observe the world around us and then to spit it back out to our audience. I often say that we're like sponges. Cartoonists are like sponges. We soak up the world around us and then squeeze it back out, and uh, usually with humor. Humor works in tandem with the culture. Um, the American philosopher Judith Butler tells us that humor relies on the culture. It either solidifies or breaks down cultural barriers and cultural um, uh, traditions. And because these constructs are often very tenuous, humor feeds off of people's anxieties and manipulates it. Humor is created out of the unexpected, the abnormal, and that's what elicits the laugh. Humor also solidifies, solidifies groups, nations, and societies and to common practices beliefs and cultural constructions. Humor can also enlighten as it exposes wrongful stereotypes and traditions. If a culture is what represents people, as was suggested yesterday, I agree that it can be a bridge between people. It can help us understand one another, and humor can help as well. So much of the discussion has been put forth on the power of culture. Who has it? What is it? It seems like the power is in the hands of the consumers and their use of social media. And it also then is in the hands of the institutions of commerce. But both are struggling for control of culture, to access it, manipulate it, to make money from it, and to get status from it. It's the role of the cartoonist to use the power of culture, and it can be for good. That means the cartoon can be strong and attack, and attack injustice, as well as soft, to celebrate the goodness of, of human endeavors. It's the role of the cartoon artist to show our show us ourselves in a good light and in a bad light. It is the role of the cartoon artist to expose ourselves as well as to show us other cultures. It is the role of the cartoon artist to show us our shared humanity, keep us honest, help us think, help us see. Societies need to support artists in doing this. Now I make cartoons about my own culture the U.S. and rarely do so of other cultures because I don't, I don't know them, I don't live there, and I don't feel that I'm qualified to comment on what it's like to live in that particular culture. So I make cartoons about my own people and my own government in the hopes that we change for the better. I make a living doing cartoons for The New Yorker and other publications, as you said, but I also tweet cartoons, I Instagram, I Vine, I Tumble, 
and I Facebook cartoons just to get my ideas out there into the into the global conversation uh, to try to get people to think. Yes. While you were talking, there was a picture by Nadia from Tunis who says, I promised Eliza I wouldn't do a drawing about her, a cartoon about her. Well, you, you've come to an agreement with Eliza. There's some uh, female solidarity there. And then with her, her friend Barack Obama, they threatened to bring about a democracy in Tunisia. <laughs> Thank you, Nadia. Um, just a few more words. So, <laughs> so, yes, I'm an optimist, and like others at the forum, I believe that we need culture in all of its wonderfulness. We need to see our differences and celebrate them. Now, last year at the forum here, I was here last year, I was privileged to be here, there was barely, if at all, any mention of women's rights and feminism. This year there has been, and I'm thankful for that, and that's, that's important. But what we need to do more than just mention it. I can think of a, a comparison of this idea of culture, imp culture and power to women's rights. If, if we think of men and of women as having two separate cultures, then it's clear we need to celebrate each for their respective uniqueness and, and acknowledge the wonderful differences and strengths of each, as we would other cultures. Now, yesterday at lunch, I, had, I was discussing with um, Nadia, the Tunisian cartoonist, about our different countries and the situations of women. In both Tunisia and the U.S., there are problems for women to differing, deg differing degrees, of course, and, and different ways. Women, women are controlled by their cultures in each, each of our societies. Um, and then on Thursday at the forum here, there was a heated exchange about women's rights in the Middle East. But the conversation at that panel never went anywhere. It never was, it never was, was continued. And, and I think we need dialogue, not confrontation. Dialogue like the kind Nadia and I had, where we shared the, in the humanity and struggles of each country's people and in the context of their own specific cultural rules. So if you define culture as tradition, traditions of people as, as um, as has been suggested, women have always been there, and they just not have been, not been acknowledged. Um, the feminist theorist Uma Narian says that women are the caretakers of the culture in which they live. Women are the teachers and primarily the ones who rear the children, basically responsible for making sure the offspring know the cultural rules in order to survive. So women have power, and every country should grant women the freedom to use their power. Globally, and pendant, and pendant mm -hmm. parles, a... While you're talking, there's a, a, another drawing by a Palestinian cartoonist about men and women, and I, uh, he uh, has a lot of silent drawings in his uh, paper, Al Qud, and this cartoonist most of the time, uh, of course, uh, makes cartoons against the Israeli uh, military, against the army, but there's always a stretched uh, hand to uh, his uh, Israeli friends, such as Kishka. And as I was saying earlier, this cartoonist uh, is uh, 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 courageous enough to uh, draw cartoons against Hamas. Not everybody has the guts to do that. But of course, if he ever sets foot in Gaza, well, I believe that might be the end of him. But uh, you already know this. Do you often go? Do you ever go to Gaza? You're not allowed to. I, I can't go to Jerusalem East or, or Gaza. Oh, surely Jerusalem East with a with with a with a uh, with a, a visa. Uh, well, there are various types of visas, but uh, the, the the men on the street uh, uh, cannot leave Israel through. Uh, the, uh, the the Tel Aviv airport. They cannot go to Jerusalem. Well, not not just anybody can go into Jerusalem. I mean, hey, you must not. You're not allowed to go there as a uh, as a terrorist. That is uh, that is uh, not allowed. Uh, when I met Shimon Peres, I said that uh, he we didn't really like the dividing wall, and he said something very uh, cute. He said, um, I showed him this uh, this uh, picture, and uh, he said Shimon Peres said. Uh, I don't like the war, but I like life. And so he was trying to say, well, look, uh, he was uh, trying to um, protect himself against the uh, attacks. I mean, you can draw cartoons and graffiti on the wall, but as I said, but you have uh, checkpoints everywhere, making life difficult. And the rap carry, when he had uh, heart uh, 
uh, problems. He was stuck at the checkpoint for nine hours before he could proceed and and make it to hospital. So uh, uh, things can be uh, very difficult indeed. And let me uh, show you uh, Barra Bukhari when, uh, uh, I mean, that is uh, Via Dolorosa, where uh, you have, well, he works as a cartoonist in Ramallah, and uh, he shows the house which uh, his family had to abandon in 1948. So he, uh, he draws for Ayala in Ramallah, uh, but he's also a painter because uh, he uh, he uh, makes a living with his paintings and, and his cartoons. Liza, uh, have you ever drawn uh, pictures on uh, Palestine in in the New Yorker magazine? Have you ever? Have you, have you, is this something you uh, you try and, and uh, depict in your cartoons? In the, I mean, I see your cartoons every year, but I get the impression that you don't want to get involved uh, or depict uh, sort of uh, struggles. But um, uh, cart cartooning uh, cartoons can be a, a cultural weapons to wake up, you know, sort of awareness to raise awareness. They can. The New Yorker doesn't run many political cartoons, and if they do. They're about um, America, not the U.S. They don't. Maybe on the cover they would they would do a uh, a cover image of of an international situation, but um, inside no. Well, that is most interesting because I believe that the New Yorker is a, a remarkably cultural paper on uh, life and cultural life of, well, of the New Yorkers. But at the same time, uh, I find it a bit uh, unfortunate that these uh, the, the cartoons um, are not challenging. I mean, they, they avoid uh, challenges. And indeed, you can find them again uh, reprinted in the French Le Figaro. I mean, I prefer Le Monde because, uh, well, in any case, Le Figaro is a more um, right-wing paper, but uh, it takes up uh, cartoons of the New Yorker because these are very sort of uh, non-confrontational, non-sort of unchallenging cartoons. But it'd, it'd be good to have some sort of, uh, of uh, uh, don't you feel the sort of inattention? Uh, I mean, sometimes don't we want to fight it out and uh, through your drawings? <laughs> Being more and more political, but not in the New Yorker. That's the New Yorker. Well, my cartoons for them are mm -hmm. about culture and about American culture for the most part. But that's that's actually can be translated into um, international color. I mean, what's going on, for example, with women in the United States is is very specific to the U.S. But it also can be um, translated to other situations of women in other countries. And I also do cartoons, so I'm being more and more political online on various websites that I work for that doing cartoons that the New Yorker won't touch. So, for example, I I. I uh, uh, did this drawing about the the, the freeing of uh, Hamas uh, inmates, people who had been sentenced to 25 years, and you have uh, the wives saying, "Ah, oh, you haven't changed at all," and uh, the men saying, "Are oh, you just as as stupid as you always were?" That's the wives in their in their uh, veiled up from head to toe, and that is sort of irritation. I I, I, I vent my my irritation in these drawings, and uh, it's a way of saying, uh, you see the. Uh, it, it gets on everybody's nerves, but I, I, I mean, I get on everybody's nerves. <laughs> That's the result of my, of my provocations. And sometimes, do you like uh, to talk about culture in Tunisia? Uh, uh, the way, uh, I mean, you, you work on, on social networks, but when you see, say, uh, cartoons, uh, uh, I mean, in the yakayaka.com, you, you, you must have seen some of the cartoons there. And uh, I've, uh, you know, on the 14 January 2011, when Ben Ali was uh, kicked out of Tun Tunisia, how did uh, 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 women respond? How did they, did they become sort of the, uh, the, the uh, a vector of uh, cultural renaissance in the civil society? Well, uh, to address this question, when you talk about culture as a factor of peace, I would say that for the time being, uh, uh, it all depends. Uh, culture may be first a factor of resistance and reconstruction. I mean, that, that is the situation in Tunisia. Three years after that green, uh, rev that Arab Spring, uh, we, uh, we are proceeding in reverse almost. I mean, uh, uh, at least as far as, as democracy is concerned, and right now it's a, a complete mess. And, and at the same time, we feel that the uh, the issue of Tunisia uh, uh, 
and as I, I, I would, I would like to call it an Arab Spring. It's more like a, an Arab winter of discontent. I mean, this sort of uh, jasmine revolution, an Arab Spring. I mean, this is all very poetic, but uh, this is activism, the reconstructing activism, trying to find our bearings and try and. Uh, have a clear vision of what we want Tunisia to be like tomorrow. I mean, there was a revolution which was set as a, a starting point, but the, the Western one, I, I mean, I do apologize, but uh, they, they, they call our revolutions, uh, I mean, the, our distress, our activism, the, the, the political assassinations, they still call this jasmine and spring, and it's uh, it's far from being the case, and just to, 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 to make it... But uh, hang on, you you uh, you are an active of uh, uh, women uh, activist, and, and and you talk about w women's positions. And I mean, of 14 January, you have to talk about the role of women because, of course, uh, you have these uh, uh, rebellions in the Arab world very often. And when you look at uh, uh, Tahrir Square in 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 uh, in Cairo, it's mostly men. But uh, here in Tunisia, you did have women, women who didn't have to wear veils. And by the way, uh, 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 this uh, uh, the, your president was not happy with this drawing at all. He said you the uh, the way you display Tunisia. I mean, uh, there was a girl who was uh, drinking beer south of Tunisia, and she was uh, she was uh, gang raped. Uh, I mean, th 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 this is sort of the sort of thing that we have to denounce. And and and, and uh, I mean, it's not just uh, uh, women being the rape in this country as a whole. We're not talking about. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, women's labor, the, the the freeing of women. It is a country freeing itself uh, from sort of a backward regime, uh, a, a sort of a, uh, and and I, I should, uh, I mean, this is a rogue state we have in Tunisia. Uh, uh, we uh, sure enough there was a rebellion, but they just uh, took over power. It has no legitimacy whatsoever, and that is that is our struggle. I mean, we elected them for a period of one year to write a constitution, and now we've uh, they've been on a. Uh, there for two years, and they and, and they're still and they still claim to be legitimate. Uh, Nadia Karik uh, has uh, a gallery in La Marsan, right next to uh, Tunis, and she had an exhibition where even the minister of culture, when uh, she uh, was being attacked by Salafists, and uh, and uh, they, I mean, they literally uh, tore down uh, the, the the walls and 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 defaced the walls, and uh, even the minister of culture didn't support them. Uh, uh, some minister of culture, indeed, and then uh, ever since, uh, uh, I mean, we, we've had the uh, the book fair in Tunisia. Uh, that book fair for the past thirty years uh, was inaugurated by the president of the republic, or at least uh, the prime minister. I mean, you had a number of uh, ministers, ambassadors, and that that was the the first time in Tunisia the book fair. Uh, I mean, it just closed in two two three weeks ago. And for the first time in Tunisia, the book fair was inaugurated by the Minister of Religious Affairs. I mean, uh, how, how bad can things get? Any case, uh, uh, so uh, the women's struggle is, of course, a cultural struggle. And, and uh, uh, right now, we organize uh, readings in uh, schools and high schools. Uh, uh, and we talk about books on democracy. Uh, there was one called the uh, election of the uh, the president of elephants, and we talk about elephants, but also uh, the sort of uh, the white vote or, or the blank vote, rather, and uh, the um, peaceful transition, and uh, and and try to tell our kids about democracy. They have no clue what this is all about. All they see is violence. And a recent uh, survey we conducted with the Arab Working Group for uh, Media Monitoring uh, over a period of two months of uh, monitoring media, the media in Tunisia, we found that the uh, uh, average rate was 73% uh, uh, presence of violence in all types of uh, uh, political discourse, left, right, or center, in the media, in the audiovisual media, the, 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 the press, uh, everywhere. Uh, so it gives you an idea of the kind of tension we have in Tunisia where uh, violence is omnipresent. And so this uh, struggle we carry with the circle of culture, we uh, do this to uh, uh, strengthen the position of women through this uh, uh, campaign that is uh, supported by the, the German JIZ uh, saying uh, in in Arab, I am here talking about women 
at the workplace and what they do to uh, reconstruct the country, saying that this is not just a political struggle. Well, it is a political struggle, but it is also an economic struggle. And the uh, Tunisian revolution started uh, basically for economic reasons, but also reasons of dignity, freedom, and uh, access to a, 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 um, a, a, a humane or uh, an acceptable life, and we, 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 we've been working in this res in this direction uh, without which, of course, Tunisia would have been in a bloodbath after uh, two incredible assassinations. Uh, and, and of course, you, 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 you have, again, the soldiers of National Guard uh, who are being uh, assassinated in, 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 I mean, we couldn't have uh, dreamt this in our, in our worst nightmares in Tunisia, and yet, and yet there we are. So Nadia, when she, to put things gently, bothered the Salafist, she said, well, perhaps I'll need to have bodyguards. And we see more and more that there are artists. Uh, Rama, who's a Venezuelan cartoonist who works for an opposition paper and has been with us for two and a half years. And the fact of making cartoons against the Chavez clan and now against President Maduro in Caracas. So people give a name and address on television. And it's more than a situation of simple threats. And I keep meeting artists and creators. In Copenhagen a couple of weeks ago, I met the cartoonist Copesegard, who has got four policemen guarding him at all times. There are two sniffer dogs who respond to different masters, who check everyone who comes to see him. And he needs more and more policemen to protect him. And when he goes to the local supermarket in Copenhagen, he needs six policemen. And so we are really living at the beginning of a meeting between representatives of the arts of creation and their bodyguards and that's something new for us yes it's new for us too because presently the majority of militants artists politicians have bodyguards because lists of their names were found on a very long list of a hit list of people to be killed by we don't know who for the time being and our dear government does not have the intention of saying who are the people who had that list drawn up. So let me give you a positive note all the same. Let's not be negative 24-7. We're not here to complain. We are here to act. We are going to rise to challenges, and Tunisia will go forward thanks to its women and its young people. That's clear. Not because of the political classes, because if we count on them, we'll never see a light at the end of the tunnel. But digital things go on giving us a place for mobilization to save others. Recently, the journalist Zied Lani, who was imprisoned for having unveiled certain truths on television was put in prison and they asked for a bail of 2,000 dinars and just a normal everyday citizen launched an appeal on Twitter and Facebook and people collected coins of one dinar in front of the courtroom and 2,000 were collected in less than half an hour. So a TV channel which was going to go bankrupt was saved with uh, another famous operation where people sold bunches of parsley and uh, they sold lots and lots of parsley and collected lots of money and saved the TV channel, which talks about resistance and democracy. And we are in full action all the time. I want to thank all of the cartoonists and artists who support the revolution. Lizzie Bensi, who is part of the network Cartooning for Peace, published a book called Women and the Future of Men with caricatures and the role of women in the Tunisian revolution, everyone is participating in this. And I think that at present, technology has allowed us to have this revolution in the first place. It's thanks to technology, because 90% of the mobilization and the broadcasting of things that are happening, whoever ends up being in power and whatever type of regime is in power in Tunisia, it is not possible 
to backtrack from that, this huge new thing, which is freedom of expression through speech, through songs. We have rappers who are in prison, but resistance groups are put together and the rappers are freed within a few days. And this is the way in which we have cultural resistance, which is generalized in our country. And we're fighting a lot for, so the Jabber, who is a cartoonist who made a drawing on Facebook, was condemned to seven years in jail. And apparently he's already served two years of that sentence. And it's possible that he may be pardoned. And if he is pardoned, he will still have spent two years in prison for one single drawing on Facebook, but still. And here, I think we also have to learn to unlearn tolerance. Because I don't want to be violent in political discourse, but we have to unlearn tolerance in some ways. And uh, when we went with Liza Donnelly and Kofi Annan in 2006 to the UN, that was the subject of the meeting of Cartooning for Peace, which was unlearned tolerance. And too often, we get a wrong message in the media in school here. Do you have any questions to ask? I see a hand raised over there. Yes, you, sir, please. Yes, good morning. I come from Chile. I am a conductor of an orchestra. And in Chile, we know the Teatro Colón in Buenos Aires, which is a very important theater. And we're very happy that in 2014, Daniel Barenboim will go to play there, and he will bring a very important orchestra, the East-West Divan. It's an orchestra which brings together young Palestinians and young Israelis. And I should like to ask the Minister of Culture of Palestine if he could tell us a bit about his experience with uh, music as a factor of unity. Yes, it was an excellent experience, which brings together Palestinians, Israelis, also Syrians, and Jordanians. I'm not against this in any way. But the effect of this type of initiative, which I repeat is a good one, is rather limited. And I think it may be somewhat deceptive to people outside. I think uh, 95 percent of people in Palestine, the man or woman in the street, don't even hear about this in the newspaper. So, I mean, it's a good thing, but it's insufficient. What I want is action in the field. And do you have a cultural budget which allows you to facilitate things, to do things in the field, as Daniel Barenboim is doing? Have you seen a minister of culture who has not complained about his or her budget? I have three and a half million euro budget with 225 civil servants. We have two cars, one of which has broken down and the other one has to. So it doesn't mean that nothing happens. But let me say something to people from the world of culture here. When I was a PLO activist and when I went on mission, I came back with bills and people paid them. Now people oblige us to go and say to capitalists and big companies how nice you are, how generous you are. And we basically have to beg for money from those economic groups for our activities. I didn't think I was going to end up doing that. And here I am. I'm a pragmatic kind of guy. And I have to deal with things as they are. So the private sector helps you and brings you sponsors? Well, that's their advertising. You know, that's what they do. But it helps, not enough, but uh, in that area, we have quite a lot still to do. And I need to say that my priority is to create libraries, for instance, in distant or isolated areas or cultural centers and small buildings so that there's a bit of dance and a bit of song. We're not talking about big budget activities here. And the gentleman from Chile, the thing that struck me when I went to Santiago de Chile, I met cartoonists, Chilean cartoonists, who draw, for instance, in the newspaper El Mercurio. And I was surprised to see cartoonists say to me that, yes, under Pinochet time, Pinochet came to see my cartoons in a gallery. And I said, wait, Pinochet is a, a dictator. And people said, oh, yeah, well, but I like them. And I 
forgot that there is a part of the Chilean people who liked Pinochet, and some of them were also cartoonists. Some obviously fought against him. And they drew only boots. When you saw a cartoon with only boots in it, you know the person being depicted was Pinochet. There was another one who, for instance, who when he wants to draw the king in Rabat, Morocco, because you haven't got the right to draw the king's face, he did that and he went to prison for four years for that, and 400,000 euros fine as well. So now when he draws the king, he draws a hand with a ring, and the ring talks and everyone understands that's the king of Morocco. In Venezuela, a country which is basically being overturned now, the musical activity of young people is one of the activities that all of the governments approve and that always works. And I think we need to remember that the cost of a violin is about 100 euros. With that amount of money, you can buy a violin and you can do quite a lot there. It's a formidable weapon, a violin. Thank you very much for your question. Madam, my name is Elizabeth Markovich. I have created this TV channel which only shows art, and it started in Arab countries. And I have been waiting impatiently for this panel because it has a link to my own life. I am a Jewish mother. I have a agnostic father. Uh, my daughter began her studies in Jerusalem, ended up in Beirut, uh, can't go back to Israel. And I've learned that I can't pronounce this word Israel when I see her in Beirut, and I have to call Israel occupied Palestine when I got to see her. So there are words that resonate on either side of a boundary. And on the basis of that personal story, I decided that art was my own god and the reason for which my way of making politics and making that television station is what it is. And I began in Arabic countries precisely because radio and TV waves know no boundaries and go from one place to another. And I say to our friends in Israel who watch our channel, just as I say this to our friends in Beirut who watch the same channel, I made a presentation yesterday during the break, and I showed on one of the screens a little playlist that I had put together for our friends, Israeli and Palestinian and Arabic friends more generally in the room, where I put all the contemporary artists Arabic, Arab, Palestinian, and Israeli together, and I challenged the room to tell me which was which. And since we only use art, we don't use words on our channel, no one speaks. Art as such, well, it's kind of difficult then to define this. And since my neighbor is Chilean, I will show him how I had some politics on September 11th, 2013, this last September. My neighbor certainly knows what happens on that date, I think you know about that. It was the day on which uh, Allende was overturned by Pinochet. And there's a very famous picture. And let me take advantage to say that there were 3,000 people killed. And uh, both in 73 and in 2011 on September 11. And in 50 years' time, the American tragedy, I have much respect for our American friends. But unfortunately, people will forget to say that the same number of people were killed on the same day years earlier in Chile. And that's exactly why we had that project, because we put this together with the most, the best known Chilean artist, Alfredo Jar, who showed on September 11th, 2013, that there was another September 11th. And Alfredo showed me there are many, many photos because this pooch lasted one hour from quarter to 12 to quarter to one, and many, many pictures were taken, black and white pictures of the bombing of the parliament, and he chose one of these. And he made a small film where he put the date September 11, 2013, the black and white picture September 11, 2013, and I had a team there on the ground who filmed exactly the same shot that you saw in the photo, but they put a video camera, a fixed camera there, and it was filmed for one hour from quarter to 12 to quarter of one, and it was a wonderful way to show how normal life is and that peace had come back to Chile. 
thank you very much for your question and for reminding us about your family background. Part of your family is from Beirut, and that reminds me of this drawing by a Lebanese cartoonist who is a Christian from Beirut. He's called Stavro, and he's also part of Cartooning for Peace. And when he draws the Hezbollah leader, Nasrallah, he calls him up and says, stop drawing me, I'm a descendant of the prophet. And so he tries to draw cartoons in Beirut, and uh, people try to stop him. And he says, well, look, you're in politics. I'll draw you. And the day you stop doing politics, we can talk about this another way, perhaps. And then perhaps just I'll show you one more thing and then one more question. Let me show you how in Tunisia we managed to get around things that are forbidden. Here you see a picture of a German model, not bad, uh, who is the girlfriend of a very well-known soccer player in Tunisia. And so when this photo is published in Europe and Tunisia, there's no problem because it's a Western journal that does this. But when the same picture is republished in a Tunisian newspaper but in Arabic language, and here you see Arabic letters and this picture, there it looks quite different. And uh, the context is rather determining. And here, Sidi Bakamsa took up that picture once again, and he's a cartoonist. And he says, uh, people who retouch photos, there's a job with the future. And so we have a sort of double debate going on here, but I think it's something very positive, and it's excellent to see Tunisian civil society on the move. One very last question. Madam. Sentia Majalovic from Europe and Ostra, but also from Belgrade. First of all, Plantu, I have to say how enormously I admire the initiative of Cartooning for Peace. It's really something essential. Coming from the Balkans, another place not far from here that has been touched by tragedy very recently, I am entirely aware of the importance of culture, of cartoons, and of humor in the fight against war and animosities of all types. But let me talk to you not about the Balkans, but about Cyprus. You were talking about the wall that separates Palestinians and Israelis. But in a member state of the European Union, we also still have a wall in Nicosia, which is a European capital. I went there just a few weeks ago because with Europa Nostra, we have taken the buffer zone of the magnificent historic city with Venetian fortifications in Nicosia, and we put it on the list of the seven most threatened sites in Europe. And that's our way of drawing people's attention to something that should be <coughs> intolerable in Europe and elsewhere in the world. And I hope that with Cartooning for Peace, we will also be able to do that because there is silence around this. We've accepted this wall in Nicosia, which we should not accept, must not accept. Lawrence Pinti, who is the Secretary of Cartooning for Peace, is organizing a meeting in Cyprus for Cartooning for Peace. And everyone in the editorial function of Cartooning for Peace is precisely trying to set up these activities to bring together not just Cartoonists. The cartoonists are basically a pretext to create other bridges where other people are trying to build walls or create separations. And that reminds me of a cartoon when Monsignor Macarius was still in power in Cyprus. That's in 73, I think. And here, once again, I think we saw that humor was a way in culture to get around dramatic situations. Monsignor Macarius died at the same time as we had a bishop, Monsignor Danilo, who died in the arms of a prostitute in France. And the church was obviously very embarrassed by this, because he died with a hooker, basically. And uh, so it was a big problem. And Macarius, the Cypriot leader, died at the same time. And Danilo had a heart attack when he was with that girl. So both of them go to heaven, and there is a cartoon in the Canard Enchaîné, and you have Macarius saying to Danilo, or Daniel, who says to Marcus, you should go back to Cyprus. There's a big mess there, except for the word in mess is the same as the word for bordello. So you see how these two stories come together. 
So the role of, car of culture here is, uh, is important. Let me show you three photos. This is in Medellin in Colombia. And there's this huge creator known as Botero, great artist. And in Medellin, that was when there were drug traders. And when I was there, the FARC was very active. And there's also the people we call falsos positivos, who are military men who disguise themselves, kill farmers and peasants, and disguise them as FARC people so as to get the reward for killing FARC people. And so the mayor of Medellin asked Botero to make a beautiful dove that would be a response to the violence in Colombia. And what was inevitable did, in fact, happen. People blew up that dove. We don't know who it was, but we can imagine. And there where I find that culture is an excellent remedy for intolerance. When the mayor of Medellin said, well, I'm going to take this away. We'll put another one there. And Botero said, no, don't touch anything at all. We'll put a second one next to it. And now on the same square in Medellin, you have two doves. And that was three years ago, and there haven't been any problems since. So I think that culture is a way around intolerance. And I would like to thank you all for your participation. Well, listen, thank you very much, Jean. Thank you to all the participants in your roundtable. I think that you showed that a short drawing is often better than a long speech. And I think that means that everyone who comes after you are going to find themselves in a difficult situation. So we made a big mistake asking you to start the morning, because that's going to make the second part of the morning difficult. Thank you very much. Bravo.